All right, well, thank you all for coming. This is a, a master's thesis defense for uh, Austin Mensburg. Uh, for a grad student, this is sort of the pinnacle of a grad experience. Uh, it's not the marching, it's the thesis defense. Um, it's the period where a student moves from the weeks and months of collecting, analyzing, being frustrated, writing, rewriting, rewriting, um, to the, uh, the chance to be a storyteller, to, be a, uh, to share with a, a public audience what the student has learned. And so that is what Austin will be sharing with us today. A little bit about the story of what uh, he has learned in his master's thesis. Before we start, let's have uh, a prayer and invite our creator to be with us. Father, this has been a uh, special journey for Austin. Thank you for the diligence and effort he has put in. I pray that as uh, he shares what he has learned, that we will be enlightened, understand a little bit more about the rich creation that you have made. In your name. All right, so uh, our presenter today is Austin, Austin Mensburg. I think all of you know Austin, or you probably wouldn't be here, right, if you didn't know Austin. Uh, Austin uh, is a grad student in biology. He's been here two years. Uh, he did his undergraduate at uh, Southern Adventist University. Um, and uh, Austin has been very diligent as a grad student. He has uh, spent a lot of time chasing down squirrels and uh, cat trees, little guys, and, uh, well, collecting their droppings and making all kinds of uh, stories out of these droppings. Uh, he's interested in what these squirrels like to eat and how that, or like to eat what they eat, and how that varies through the season. 13 line ground squirrels is a species of interest, and today he's going to share with us a story of what he's learned. So let's welcome Austin. Austin, the time is yours. Thank you. Today I will be sharing with you my summary of my research on the local population of 13 lined ground squirrels. Give a brief overview. I will be sharing some pertinent background information, introductory material, details on my methods of how I captured the squirrels, so the results that I found, and finally a discussion of those results. To give some context, these little guys are obligate hibernators. They range widely across Central North America, and they are one of the more omnivorous ground squirrel species with their diet consisting of up to 70% animal matter. Moving into introduction, we can see that the diet of small herbivores can change with the seasons across both years and location. For example, a study of Mojave ground squirrels in Southern California was found that after a wet winter, the spring diet of these squirrels consisted of about 23% shrub leaves, but jumped to over 66% after a dry winter. With regards to location, a study of 13 line ground squirrels, these little guys, in Colorado, there we go, in Colorado, found that during the spring and summer, the squirrels really liked, or they consumed high quantities of scarlet blue marrow but a study of the same species during the same seasons in Indiana found that the squirrels consumed high levels of clover. This is an excellent example of geographic variation or dietary plasticity. Basically the idea that the same species of squirrel with the same ability to eat the same sorts of food may choose a different diet based on different locations where they live and what food is available for the ultimate nutritional need that they seek after. With regards to diet, we can also see that there are both opportunistic and selective dietary patterns. A colony of Arctic ground squirrels in northern Alaska is a good example of the opportunistic pattern, where they just ate pretty much whatever food was available, particularly with regards to forbs and ectomycorrhizal shrubs. On the other hand, a colony of Colombian ground squirrels in Montana were found to exhibit the selective dietary pattern 
where two-thirds of the colony chose the maximally energetically favorable diet, despite what food was available or not, while the other third made some non-optimal foraging decisions. Looking at methods of tracking diet variation, one that might pop into your head is direct observation. However, there are some challenges to this method. First of all, these squirrels have very cryptic coloration as well as movements, so it can be rather challenging to find a squirrel in the first place. Additionally, if you are like me, interested in diet, it can be even more challenging to find a squirrel eating a food item, be able to correctly identify the food item before the squirrel finishes munching down his lunch. Thus, while direct observation is a great idea in theory, it's not so much a great idea in practice. The, another method of tracking diet variation that actually several papers have used is stomach content analysis, which basically involves killing the squirrel, opening up the stomach, and identifying the contents. Many papers have used this method. However, challenges include a difficulty to identify the food items as some of the digestive process has already occurred. In addition, the ethics of how many squirrels is it okay to kill in the name of science. The last method, fecal sample analysis, is the method that I chose to use, which in short involves live capturing the squirrels, collecting fecal samples from them, and then letting the squirrels go. Challenges of this method include the entire digestive process has occurred, so it is a little bit more challenging to figure out what the squirrels are eating. However, there are several benefits. First of all, it reduces ethical dilemmas. You are not intentionally killing the squirrels at all. In addition, you're able to conduct multiple analyses from the same sample. For example, many times a squirrel would give me four fecal pellets, and I would send two off for microzoological analysis and two off for isotopic analysis. This way, and both of these analyses are sub-areas of fecal sample analysis. This way, as we will see later on in the presentation, I am able to collect data on the same squirrels from two different labs and compare two different data sets with each other, which I find to be quite powerful. In brief, the microzoological analysis involves the dissection of fecal samples and recording how often fragments of certain food items are found over a set number of microscopic scans. For the lab that I worked with, that number was 20. Then the sample fragments are compared to an already identified reference collection for identification of the sample food items. With regards to isotopic analysis, it basically consists of comparing the rare isotope or version of an element such as 13 carbon to the more common isotope of an element such as 12 carbon or 12 C. This ratio is then expressed as the difference from the standard and written in parts per thousand, which basically looks like a really funny percent symbol. There were two specific types of isotopic analysis that I looked into. First of all being delta 13C for carbon and delta 15N for nitrogen. The primary control in delta 13C is C3 versus C4, this division of different types of photosynthesis in plants. In C3 plants, initial carbon fixation is catalyzed by the enzyme rubisco. This pro process strongly discriminates against 13C, resulting in delta 13C values of about negative 27 parts per thousand in C3 plant tissues. In other words, if a squirrel fecal pellet consisted of pure C3 food items, you would show up right about where the arrow says all C3 diet on the figure. In contrast, initial carbon fixation of C4 plants is catalyzed by pep carboxylase an enzyme with the high affinity for CO2. Because of this, PEP carboxylase discriminates less strongly against 13C, resulting in higher delta 13C values of roughly negative 11 to negative 15 parts per thousand, or roughly about there. 
C4 plants are typically found in either more southern latitudes or in the more hotter portions of the year. This is because biologically C4 plants are more efficient in doing photosynthesis in high temperature situations. This is because C4 plants are more efficient in bringing in CO2 through the stomatopores in the leaf with the stomatopores having smaller diameter openings. As you can imagine, if you were a plant in a hot condition, you want to conserve water, you want to avoid evaporation, and if you close your pores to the outside world, that's a great way to conserve water. But on the flip side, it's a double-edged sword in that it's harder for CO2 to come into the plant. Thus, CO4 plants thrive in hotter conditions because they are more efficient at bringing in CO2 despite the smaller diameter pores. And as some examples of food items, C3 and C4 food items that are on the Perkin Line Ground Squirrel menu, we have the red clover as a C3 food item and Indian goosegrass as a C4 food item. Moving on to delta 15N, we can see that it is more complexly controlled than delta 13C. One of these controlling factors is trophic position. The idea is that the higher up the trophic level an animal occupies, the higher its delta 15N values will be. As we can see, two, two um, examples of food chains here, uh, C3 down with lower delta 13C values and C4 which has higher delta 13C values and the arrows conveniently connect everybody. When we look on the y-axis which shows delta 15N, we can see that item, food items such as the flower or grass have lower delta 15N values than say the wolf or the lion up at the top. Thus when studying omnivorous animals who may have different diet choices based on season, delta, delta 15N values may illuminate when the animals are more carnivorous, elevated delta 15N, and more herbivorous, lower delta 15N. While several papers promote this view, the agreement is not universal between all papers on the topic, and thus the serious impact of the delta 15N truck position link may be limited. However, another potential measure of trophic position is fecal sample carbon-nitrogen ratios, which may also reflect an animal's degree of carnivory. For example, a lower ratio, that is a larger N or nitrogen number, may indicate higher protein content of foods consumed, i.e. more animals consumed, whereas a higher ratio may indicate foods with a lower protein content or fewer animals consumed. Relative to my study are three previous papers that show seasonal diet variation in 13 lion ground squirrels that were conducted in Iowa, Colorado, and Indiana. For example, in Iowa, squirrels were found to consume some insects in the spring and even more in the summertime. In Colorado, the squirrels were found to consume grasses and forbs pretty equally all throughout the seasons. And in Indiana, the squirrels were found to consume chickweed seeds and butterfly larvae in the springtime, clover and butterfly larvae in the summer, and some grasses in the fall time. However, despite the variation, what unified all of these studies was their findings of fall diet, which consisted of insects, insects, and more insects, particularly grasshoppers. Thus, one of my hypotheses going into my project was that despite what my squirrels may exhibit in seasonal diet variation in spring and summer, very likely they would consume lots of grasshoppers or if at least lots of insects in the fall time. In summary, while there is seasonal and geographic variation, overall there is a trend towards increased arthropod consumption in the fall time. And looking at prior work in the Goodwin lab shows and suggests that burying of 13 lying around squirrels here in the Roseville Cemetery just south of town underwent a sharp diet change in late summer 2007 from a predominantly C3 to C4 diet. This inference was based 
on a prominent spike in the Delta 13C of incisory enamel deposited mid-August to mid-September, which can be most efficiently seen inside the red box. Particularly if you see the white and gray triangles, these are examples of just two squirrels out of several that exhibited this pattern. You can see the lower dotted line is a, what would represent a pure C3 dye. The top dotted line would represent a pure C4 dye. And these two squirrels started off more closer to the pure C3 diet, spiked to definitely the pure C4 diet line, and then decreased prior to hibernation. However, the identity of the C4 material was not determined. Hypotheses, though, included C4 plants and or possibly insects. Thus, Dovetail's my project which was to characterize diet variation with microhistological work with regards to two hypotheses. One, do squirrels increase arthropod consumption late in the season? And two, do squirrels increase their C4 consumption late in the season? And what exactly are these squirrels eating? The isotope work would provide additional backup evidence. And I should note that my study is the first non-lethal study of diet variation in this species. Moving on to methods. You can imagine that in order to collect the fecal samples, I had to get up close and personal with the little squirrels, and thus I would trap the little guys. One of the main characteristics of the trap was a about four by four inch hole on this side of the trap, and thus you may wonder, how did I figure out where the squirrels were to to catch. Basically, I would see them come out of their hole in the ground, and then I know when they went back down, soon they would be coming back up again. So when I see a squirrel go down into a hole, I would place the trap with this hole directly over the burrow hole, and then stake the trap into the ground to keep it secure so the squirrel couldn't pick up the trap and move it away. Um, but then the squirrel would ideally come up push up the flap, which is just worked by gravity, come into the trap here, and many times, for ease of successful capture, I would place a white bag on this far side. Thus, the squirrel would come in here, and after five or 10 minutes, I would side the squirrel, come over to process him, put my gloved hand down here with the squirrel on this side, and now that he's blocked off, I can take the bag off and zip it up and you catch a squirrel in the bag, easy as that. Supposedly easy as that. <laughs> but um, the reason the black tray was in the process, was underneath this whole contraption, was to aid in the collection of fecal samples. I know that I'm not going to hurt the squirrels, but they don't know that. And the squirrels were found to defecate quite easily while they're under nervous conditions, which basically meant when they were in my trap. So in order to successfully catch the fecal samples they may deposit prior to being in the bag, I placed the trap, the, the tray underneath the whole contraption in order to help catch the samples. Moving on, looking at processing and handling, I would collect squirrel weight information by just had some hanging, hanging, um, hanging balance and um, of scales to weigh the squirrel in the bag, and then I would weigh the empty bag afterwards to collect the difference. Um, visually ascertain the gender, fecal samples I already described, as well as I would ear tag the squirrels while I had access to a field assistant. As you can imagine, these little guys, it was at least a three to four hand process to place an ear tag on one of them successfully. The purpose of this was to track individual squirrels across seasons. So for example, a squirrel that maybe I tag in the summer, I could then recapture potentially in the fall and see individual data of how that squirrel's body mass or diet changed. Wrapping up the methods, the fecal pellets were labeled, frozen, and then dried at about 70, at 70 degrees Celsius for about eight to 10 hours prior to sending off for analysis in two different labs. I sent, some, I sent samples to uh, microcomposition laboratories, which focused in the microhistological work. 
as well as the Stable Isotope Ratio Facility for Environmental Research Lab at the University of Utah, which focused on isotopic work. Sent samples off to both labs. Should mention that prior to, to transport, Surfer asked me to grind up the samples with mortar and pestle. However, MCL was fine with me just sending the dried samples as is intact to them. Now let's move on to results, which is the exciting part of my opinion. Um, basically, we can see that capture location shifted throughout time. Looking at, this is the western half of Rosal Cemetery that I covered, that the squirrels predominantly lived in, that during the first two months of the, the season, mostly I caught squirrels in the lower two-thirds of the cemetery, and then in the last three months, I captured most of them in the upper third of the cemetery. I'm not entirely sure what caused this trend or difference as I, every 15 or 20 minutes, would walk around that center third of the road to kind of get a good visual on all thirds of the cemetery. However, I do think it is an interesting trend worthy of note. Also, I found that body mass varies throughout time. You can see Starting in June, I caught some fairly heavy squirrels, around the 100 to 125 gram range. And then in July, I captured some very low weight squirrels. And overall, the capture weight increased as the seasons progressed. Thus, I interpreted the initial heavier squirrels as adults, with the very low weight squirrels slightly later in the season and onward as probable juveniles. I should note two particularly important squirrels I think worthy of note are a very heavy individual that I interpreted as a late season adult as well as a tracked individual. This was the one squirrel that did keep an ear tag on so I have solid data for him in late August and then secondly when I caught him in late September. So while there is spatial variation in capture location and body mass, the main focus of this study was diet variation. Thus, looking at the data, I found two overall dietary shifts. The first of all being that the squirrels ate arthropods early in the season. You can see in June and July, there's a lot of, of arthropod consumption, very high. And then August and onward, there's very low to no arthropod consumption. And when we compare this microhistological data with, in A, with the delta 15N or isotopic data in B, as well as the 1 over CN ratio data in C, which correlates to total nitrogen content in fecal samples, we can see overall that the, it is, the data does show that the squirrels decrease their arthropod consumption as the seasons progressed. And as you may have already figured out, my results differ with prior findings, particularly the findings of all three papers that I had showed you of how in the fall time the squirrels ate arthropods predominantly increased in the fall time. I really don't know why these my squirrels decided to exhibit a completely opposite dietary pattern than their cousins, but I do think this is a very important finding and worthy of future work and study. The second dietary shift I found was that of grass seeds and blooms consumption, that there was an increase in August and onwards, blooms basically being the outer sheath of the grass seeds themselves. In short, there was very little to no grass seed consumption early in the season, but late August, the squirrels demonstrated an abrupt increase, a shift in consuming gra grass seeds and pretty much cons continued that level of consumption for the rest of the season. When you compare that uh, microsological data in A to the isotopic data of the delta 13C in B, we can see that while they're not exactly the same graph, they do tell very similar stories. Thus, this tells me that whatever that the increase of C4 plant consumption talked about in B of the isotopic data is very likely the grass seeds that were started to be highly consumed in 
August for the microsiological data. And for a little bit more clarity, we can see that the C3 eaters were down there by about negative 27 parts per thousand, and the C4 eaters were a little higher, right about negative 11 to negative 15 parts per thousand. And the punchline being, my results actually confirm prior findings in the Goodman lab. As you may remember, the 2007 incisor enamel work showed a sharp increase of C4, plant, of C4 consumption late in the season, right around late August. So, I think that is very cool. Moving on to discussion, asking the question, are the dietary shifts that my squirrels exhibited opportunistic or selective? I would put forth that I believe I have some circumstantial evidence that at least two of my squirrels engaged in some, in some selective dietary behavior, which I basically call the fat meat threshold postulate, which can be explained as follows. We have the body mass diagram on the left, the grass seeds and blooms diagram on the right, and going back to our favorite two squirrels, we can see the late season adult and tracked individual. The late season adult had the was the heaviest capture I had. The second time that I captured the tracked individual was the second heaviest capture I had all season long. And when we look at how much grass seeds and blooms the late season adult was eating, it was none. And in the same vein, the tracked individual at the same time he was increasing in weight, was decreasing his grass seeds and blooms consumption. Thus, as one of the big picture important things for a juvenile squirrel to do is to grow and fatten for the winter ahead, I wonder if there's some sort of a fattening threshold, if there's, so, if there's like X amount of nutritional benefit that the squirrels gain from consuming grass seeds and blooms, and once they have already reached that level, they cease continuing consuming grass seeds and blooms. I think this is a good example of it being the late season adult and the tracked individual showing further, further support for this idea of somewhat of a selective, somewhat of a selective dietary pattern. Moving on to limitations. Due to permitting restrictions from the Michigan DNR, I was only able to collect data for summer and fall. While that was plenty to show the change between C3 and C4, I do think that meaningful future work for colleagues to engage in would be to conduct the same analyses on spring data on, 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 during the springtime and compare that data with my own, so you have all three seasons of the active season of these squirrels. In addition, I only collected voucher specimens for each plant species. So, for example, if I found a white clover in June, I collected it, identified it, mounted it, but did not look specifically for the presence of white clover in the remaining months of the season. Thus, I also believe meaningful future work could include a study of seasonal plant variation on Rose Hill Cemetery and comparing how the plants vary based from a human observer eye point or viewpoint to the microsological data of what exactly the squirrels are consuming. In conclusion, prior research of Delta 13C in incisor enamel had suggested that 13 line ground squirrels in southwest Michigan exhibited a late season spike in C4 plant consumption, but did not identify the source of this dietary shift. My research has confirmed this dietary shift through microhistological and Delta 13C analysis. In August, squirrels began to heavily consume grass seeds and blooms with Delta 13C demonstrating that this late season diet was enriched in C4 plants. In addition, I have demonstrated a dramatic but previously unknown shift in arthropod consumption from a high consumption of arthropods in June to little if any consumption of arthropods late in the season. This trophic shift was further supported by a decrease in delta 15N. And this dietary shift based on both microhistological and isotopic analyses is in conflict with prior studies. 
Thus, my thesis provides the foundation for future work and discovery in the area of dietary patterns of 13 line ground squirrels. I would like to acknowledge several people who have helped me in this process. First of all, being Dr. Gonzalez and Dr. Navia for agreeing to be on my committee and the feedback they have provided in those roles. I'd like to extend a special thanks to Dr. Goodwin for both being on my committee as well as being my major professor. Without him, this project would not have occurred at all. I um, would also like to uh, extend thanks to my parent institution, Andrews University, for awarding me a grants in aid of research grant last year that enabled me to send the, the samples off for microhistological analysis and receive all of those fascinating discoveries. I'd also like to thank Jeremy McClarty for assistance out in the field, Dr. Shondell Henson from over in the math department for help in mathematical analysis, and last but not least, I would like to thank you for coming to my presentation today. Now, um, Austin's uh, main conversation will be with his committee in a few minutes uh, in another room. But uh, before we go there, we, we uh, would like to open it up and uh, any questions that you as the audience would like to ask I have a question, not Austin, may not answer it. Since you are showing that the diet, the arthropods, they tend to consume them early in, yeah. the, in the spring. Yeah. I know the arthropods are very low, the population in late winter, during winter, early spring. So I'm wondering, um, it doesn't seem to make sense. It seems to me like they would have more arthropods late when you have more of them, yeah. I wonder where they are getting them from. Are they capturing them? Well, keep know. in mind, so tell them where we have our data start. Where are the data start? Our data starts in June, and it goes through October. Oh, OK. So the early part for you is June. Yes. Right. OK. Yeah. That, OK. That's, I, I thought it was beginning like somewhere out the early no. But by August, they're eating almost none, which is odd, because yes. octopods are still plenty. Yeah, they're they are plenty. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> What do you think they eat in the winter? Because I still the squirrels I bring in. What do the squirrels eat? They still I see some of them running around when it warms up in the middle of winter. Not the thirteen line ground Different species. Uh, I, oh. I, I know okay. I, I know the thirteen line ground squirrel, which I did my research on, does hibernate during the winter from about October, November through March or April. So what I see here is yeah, I've, I've, not, I've not found any 13 line ground squirrels on campus. I've seen chipmunks, which look very similar, but I haven't seen 13 line ground squirrels. Okay. Yes, so I have a question. Uh, at somewhere towards the very beginning, you mentioned that there were, and I could be getting the word wrong, yeah. obligate? Hibernate. Obligate, hibernate. Yes. So could you explain a little bit on what that means yes. and maybe what are the different kinds of hibernation that yes. it's <coughs> ground squirrels go through so to differentiate For sure. Them? Let me get back to that Thank slide. You. Back to the very beginning. Uh, yeah. So obligate means that they go into hibernation more regardless of temperature or access to food. That they're kind of going in more at a set time. Not that the environment may not still play a role, but it's a little bit more independent. Uh, I do not know the specific scientific terms for other types of hibernation, but I would also it makes sense that there would be a type of hibernation that is connected with how long the days are, or the temperature, or how much food they have. So I would kind of say there, there's obligate, and then there's whatever you want to call it. I need to learn the term of where they are dependent on certain environmental factors. I'm faculty. Faculty. Okay. So the fat lid threshold. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's you, have fun talking. <laughs> have you seen examples of that in other species? Sure. Anything that's similar to, to what you're proposing? I have not as so far yet, mm -hmm. but that is something that I would definitely want to look into if I were going to continue the project, for sure, because I think it would my, it would add more weight to my idea if I saw it in other species, especially other ground squirrels. It's a speculation at this point. Yeah. 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 I 
So do you have to get permission from the managers of the cemetery for it to be uh, working there? Or how I did. Work? Dr. Goodwin and I had to get permission from the Michigan DNR, from Andrews I.A. Cook, as well as the owners of the cemetery. And since they maintain the mow, mm -hmm. the cemetery, on a regular basis. So where are the squirrels getting all this grass from? From the forests around? There's not a whole bunch of forest around. There is a few rows of forest-like trees on the perimeter. Yeah. I have been out there many times, and it's they they mow so infrequently that the grasses grow really long before the. They, they mow again, and so there's plenty of time to receive grasses, or maybe the, the lawn mowers don't get exactly close to a tombstone, and so there's a few yeah. long grasses that are left. That would be my, would be my best hypothesis. But of course, when you, when you mow, the grasses are under selection, and the grasses that can seed at a low, you know, mm -hmm. when they're really low, will go and seed. So there's still, there's still stuff. The species is actually a short grass species. And so uh, they, in fact, have expanded their range with human modification. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because humans, uh, we, we make short grass habitats by mowing. Yeah, I was reading a paper that mentioned originally their range was maybe only to farther west in the Midwest, maybe Iowa or so. But when the people came into like Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, Indiana and cleared the land, the squirrels followed along. And so this is a case where an animal, rather than being ousted by people, is actually kind of enhanced their range by, by people's effect on the land. Time for one last question. Let's give Austin a hand. Uh, a few comments on what is next. So, um, uh, Angela 